In chemistry, we talk a lot about equilibrium, and usually we're talking about equilibrium in chemical processes, and we think about it in terms of concentration, but I want to talk a little bit today about equilibrium in the context of energy. So Gibbs free energy, that G, that capital G, um, and equilibrium are um, intertwined, and so I want to think about it graphically first, and then we'll kind of walk through a problem of how everything is related um, together. So the first thing that we need to kind of remind ourselves is that Gibbs free energy is essentially the uh, energy that's available to do work. So the change in Gibbs free energy, and of course we as scientists are usually interested in the change of states, um, so how something changes over time is more interesting than the state of affairs um, currently. So this is equal to the work, the maximum amount of work that can be done. Um, so you could kind of think about this as the maximum useful work. And remember, work in a scientific context is just overcoming some sort of resistance. So the, the free energy that's available is going to give you how much you can actually do with it. Um, so if we think about a spontaneous process then, because kind of uh, one of the focuses of Gibbs free energy is whether or not a reaction is spontaneous or non-spontaneous. If we think about a spontaneous process, the reactants are going to have a higher amount of Gibbs free energy the products have a lower amount and we know that it has to be this way because when I take the difference of them, right, if I take my smaller energy from my products, subtract my larger energy from my reactants, that would give me a delta G that's negative. And a negative delta G means that I have a spontaneous process. So uh, we might have a graph that looks like this with kind of time or reaction progress that's here on my x-axis and free energy that's on my y. Um, the place where this graph then goes as the reaction progresses from reactants to products, then that energy is used up, right? We kind of have free energy going down. At the very minimum point here, there's going to be this slight dip in my curve. That very minimum point is going to be my equilibrium. And again, equilibrium in a thermodynamic context, thinking about this as the equilibrium of the energies of my reactants and products. So this is going to be the lowest, um, the minimum point on my curve. So how would this look different then if I was thinking about a non-spontaneous process? Well, my curve would be flipped, right? Because the sign on my delta G would be positive. So we might have something that looks a little bit more like this, where we have reactants with lower free energy, products with higher free energy, this minimum of my curve here is still equilibrium. And then my delta G is going to be a positive value. Okay, and when we're thinking about our delta G, we're really just taking the difference as we have with enthalpies and all of our other reaction kind of conditions. We take the difference between the reactants and the products and then that difference here gives us our delta G. And so if I end with something that's higher than my initial quantity here, that gives me a positive difference. So this would be a non-spontaneous process. Now if we can talk about equilibrium with the with respect to thermodynamics, with respect to energy, which we can, then uh, we must be able to talk about equilibrium constants. And we can relate the equilibrium constants to this change in free energy. So under non-standard conditions, so this would be my change in Gibbs free energy under non-standard conditions. And of course, standard conditions um, from a thermodynamic standpoint really has most to do with temperature. So that would be at 25 degrees Celsius um, is equal to the change in Gibbs free energy at standard conditions. And we can tell by that degree symbol, which just means that it's under standard conditions. R, R is a familiar face. We've been using R since gas law kind of equations. So this R is our thermodynamic R, so we need to have the units of um, joules per mole Kelvin. So it's going to be our 8.31. T is the absolute temperature, so it's going to be in Kelvin. Absolute. And then Q here is our reaction quotient. 
which we've used in equilibria type uh, equations before when we've tried to figure out, well, if we're not at standard conditions or we're not quite at equilibrium, then we uh, can plug values into Q to kind of see where we're at. And so that reaction quotient then at equilibrium is equal to K. So the Q is equal to K and at equilibrium, the delta G is going to be equal to zero. So if this is under my non-standard condition, but I'm at equilibrium, then that means if I kind of plug in these values, then I end up with zero is equal to my delta G at standard conditions, and then plus my RT. And then now I have the ln of K, my equilibrium constant. When I have K here with no subscript, that's the thermodynamic equilibrium constant. So there's a lot of K values. Um, if you've studied equilibrium for any length of time, you know there's a zillion different K values with a zillion different subscripts, which tell you an interesting information about those particular reactions. If there's no subscript, it's usually the thermodynamic uh, equilibrium constant. Okay, so I've set this equal to zero. If I do some rearrangement, um, because I'm interested in my delta G, because that Gibbs free energy is what's giving me information about the spontaneity of the reaction. And if I want to relate the delta G to the K, my equilibrium constant, then the delta G is going to be equal to negative RT ln of K. And this is also an incredibly important um, equation, especially thinking about equilibrium, thermodynamic equilibrium. So let's look at a problem to do some examples of calculations here. So let's look at the reaction. The reaction here is for the creation of, um, of urea. So this is urea, which was a really important compound. Um, it's one of the uh, beginnings of organic chemistry, actually, the first time they synthesized urea in a lab. Um, this was actually Friedrich Wohler who synthesized urea in the lab. Friedrich Wohler. And he was playing around in the lab and actually something crystallized out and he goes, ah, that kind of looks like urea. And what he found is that from inorganic components, he could make an organic molecule, organic meaning carbon containing here. And so for the first time, you know, he said, well, I can make urea without a kidney. So that was kind of the birth of synthetic organic chemistry. So this is a really important reaction for the history of chemistry. So, um, Here's the problem is uh, what is the equilibrium constant for this reaction? And it gives you no data except for the reaction itself. Well, uh, you'd have to go into the thermodynamic tables um, because from our delta G, if we use that um, equation that we were given before, so our delta G is equal to the negative RT ln of K, then we can figure out K from that particular value. But I need to figure out my delta G first. And we know that delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S, because we have that tattooed on our bodies now. Okay, one of the most important equations in chemistry. So in order to get to my delta G value, I need to solve for this guy. We're at standard conditions, so we know that our temperature is going to be 298 Kelvin. Okay. So that's something that we know. We know our R value, so um, that'll be our 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, so that'll be an important value. And then to get to my delta H and my delta S, I need to go to the thermodynamic table. So you probably have seen tables, if you've been studying chemistry a while and studied thermodynamics, You've seen tables that look like this. These are for your enthalpies. You're given values at, of specific compounds at specific at our standard temperature in our specific phases. And then we also have the same for entropies at 25. So I'm going to go into my tables and I get the values. And then for my enthalpies, I've just kind of taken them all out here. And we know that our delta H is going to be equal to the uh, sum of the uh, products minus reactants. So it's going to look like this. 
minus reactants. And we have to take into account our molar quantities of each. So I'm taking into account how many there are in this particular reaction. And that gives me this. And our standard enthalpies are in kilojoules per mole. So here's products minus reactants. Um, one of the things that you'll note here is that even though I have phases that I usually wouldn't include in an equilibrium constant expression, like a pure liquid, we're talking about the energies here. And so for energy, we do include everything because the energies of everything are going to play into um, our energetic thermodynamic equilibrium constant. So what does this tell me about this reaction? Well, it's a negative sign, so it means that this is an exothermic process. So that's good, good to know, and good for spontaneity. And now I do the same thing with my entropies. So these are the entropies that I found. I do the same kind of operation. So I'm going to spare you the details there. So let's go 356 joules per Kelvin, joules per mole Kelvin. And because I'm going to be putting them into my delta G, I'm going to convert this to kilojoules. So that gives me this. Now it's negative. What does that tell me about this reaction? It's a negative delta S, which means that I'm getting more ordered, right? Negative delta S is a bad thing, so we're getting more order in the system. Um, which kind of makes sense, because if we go back to the original equation here, we start off with a bunch of gases. That's good in terms of entropy. I'm going into solution kind of chemistry with some water, so we're getting to more organized phases. So we would expect the delta S to be negative for this. It may be harder to predict a delta H, but with the values given, we know that it's exothermic. So we have negative delta H, negative delta S. That means this is a temperature-dependent reaction if we're thinking about spontaneity. All right, so we plug it in for delta G. Here's my delta H minus T delta S. So this is going to give me an answer in kilojoules, and again, kilojoules per mole, because the per mole is implied throughout, sometimes explicitly, sometimes less so. Okay, so uh, it's a negative value. That means that it's a spontaneous reaction. So that's interesting information. Now we can plug it into our equation above, right? So here's the equation that we're looking at now. We have a delta G, we have our T, we have our R. So when we plug in, we end up with, um, let me just rewrite it here. All right. Here's this. We're solving for K, so we probably want to just get kind of the natural log of K by itself. And then we can have our delta G over negative RT. And when I plug in my values here, then I have this, negative 13, kilojoule per mole, R. We're going to have to do some rearrangement here because we have our R in joules and we have this guy in kilojoules. So, of course, we can kind of, you know, do some conversion. We're snappy with the metric system now. Okay, so when we rearrange, then we end up with, and get these guys in the same units, then we end up with a, a natural log of K is equal to 5.49. And we know to undo a natural log, we need to take e to the x. And so when I take e to the x, I end up with a k that's equal to 2.4 times 10 to the second. Well, what does that mean? It's a pretty large value. So because it's large, that means that the products are favored in this reaction. And it's a spontaneous process. And we can tell that it's a spontaneous process because the delta G is negative as well. So kind of a fun way to get at the equilibrium constant and relating it to energy.